Well, good morning to you, or maybe good afternoon, or heck, I'm not even sure. Maybe it's uh, good evening. I'm not sure when you're watching this. But uh, this is Mr. Kamadron. I'm back with uh, another screencast, and our topic is Jacksonian democracy. There's a, a picture of Andrew Jackson in uh, Jackson Square in uh, New Orleans. And our essential question, if you can get that for me at this time, is how truly democratic was Andrew Jackson when dealing with issues during his presidency? And if you notice a political cartoon right there, that is King Andrew Jackson, as many would call him. And uh, there's a lot of controversy with this, but uh, we'll get into that a little later. So let's continue our first section that we will be writing our subtopic here is Rise to the Presidency. And if you could label that for me. Well, let me give you a little background here on Andrew Jackson. Okay, he is definitely not your typical uh, president. He didn't uh, grow up uh, Richie Rich, per se, uh, John Quincy Adams and others. Uh, he had a very, very uh, different childhood. Uh, and so our first bullet here, Andrew Jackson grew up in a very poor region along the borders of North and South Carolina, and later would move to Tennessee. Now, he had an uh, older brother that would die uh, during his teenage years. Uh, his father died when he was very, very young. And uh, truly, he just grew up very, very poor and uh, was not a studious guy, was definitely not uh, what we would consider a, a bookworm. Uh, but uh, just the opposite, actually got himself into a lot of trouble. But uh, which leads us to our second bullet. It was in the military where he really began to excel and felt a sense of family and dedication to country. Now, he really did well in the military, rising up the ranks. Uh, he would also become a lawyer. Uh, but, but it was as a field commander, he led the Tennessee militia, in various battles, but most notably the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812. And uh, we know a story about the War of uh, 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans. It actually didn't even have to happen because it was after the Treaty of Ghent. I know you're very familiar with that. And also, in April 1818, Jackson's troops invaded Florida to capture Seminole Raiders and began the first Seminole War, which would lead to the Adams-Onus Treaty with Spain. Now, at this time, President Monroe uh, is a president. He had asked Jackson to head down there and really just kind of survey the scene, but not to be in, take an aggressive role, but Jackson kind of doing what he normally does, which is what he wants, uh, would actually attack. And uh, Spain would eventually end up signing a treaty and so in one way, you can kind of say Jackson uh, went over to Florida, grabbed it, took it, and uh, it will become a part of the United States. Now, Jackson is really getting popular at this time. And you know what I like to say, America loves her war heroes. So what happens in the election of 1824, Andrew Jackson had the most popular votes, but did not have sufficient enough electoral votes to win the presidency. Um, what is going to end up happening here, he ran against John Quincy Adams, and John Quincy Adams had uh, quite a bit of friends. So one of them in particular was Henry Clay. Yeah, that's right. The good Henry Clay from the American system. Well, here's the bad Henry Clay. This is where he shows up. So what does occur here is this. And which is our last bullet, a corrupt bargain was allegedly, and I use the words allegedly, made between Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams, providing the necessary votes needed in the House of Representatives. The, the vote went to the House of Representatives as it, did, as it did in the election of 1800. You're familiar with that. And supposedly, Henry Clay's uh, voters decided to vote for JQA. Jackson loses the election, and the sixth president is JQA and not Andrew Jackson. So write a question, return to the screencast, and then we'll resume. 
Okay, so let's get to it. The next section is called Expansion of Democracy. Well, Jackson, in essence, got ripped off. He loses the election, and his peeps, his people, his supporters are extremely frustrated. And our first bullet, Jackson's supporters believed he should have won the election, and they were determined to help get him into the White House. So if you recall the voting, remember it used to be um, 21 white male landowner. Well, it's going to get changed. And many states lowered or even eliminated the requirement that men own a property in order to vote or hold office. So the old 21 white male landowner is now going to become 18 non-landowner and still white male. So again, 21 white male landowner is going to be 18 white male, but the key is non-landowner. Because let's face it, most 18-year-olds don't own land. And at that time, even more so. So this increase of voting rights by changing property requirements would later become known as Jacksonian democracy. So what happens here, there's rematch, round two, and now we got Andrew Jackson, as you see up here, versus JQA. And in the rematch, the election of 1828 contest was in fact a rematch of the previous election between Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. So what happens this time, very, very different. And in the end, when the ballots were counted, Jackson had defeated Adams, winning a record amount of popular and electoral votes. So Andrew Jackson becomes president number seven, and JQA, just like dad, only gets four years and he's out. So write a question, return to the screencast, and then we'll resume. All right, well, let's get to the next section, which is called sectional differences increase. So you have uh, the United States at this time is really starting to, uh, I guess one could say, blossom, expand. You're going to have three sections where before you really had the north and the south now you can have the north the south and the west so the north had an industrial economy based on manufacturing and they supported tariffs or taxes that would export american products so the north in a sense here uh, you know remember this is the the producers this is the uh, the manufacturers of businesses. Now the South, our second bullet, they had an agrarian economy. And if you remember, agrarian means farming. That was based on agriculture and did not support tariffs, which increased imported goods. Now the West, well, you got the North, you got the South. Now the West, the West had an emerging economy. In other words, they're expanding. They're getting bitter. They're, more people are moving out there. The West had an emerging economy that supported internal improvements and the sale of public lands. Well, I'm going to make me a cup of coffee here. Um, what happens just before Andrew Jackson takes office, well, you know, it's amazing. Just like Father like son, because if you remember just before Jefferson took office, uh, Adams uh, had the old midnight judges issue. Well, like father like son here, before Andrew Jackson took office, Congress, under the direction, of course, of JQA, Congress passed a high tariff on imports that affected Southerners, which they called the tariff of abominations. So, JQA gets Congress to pass a tax just before he walks out the door and gives the keys to Andrew Jackson, which should be very similar to you 
uh, because it happened with dad with Thomas Jefferson. So write a question, come back to the screencast, and we'll continue. And I'm going to go get my uh, cup of coffee. Be right back. I'm back with my uh, cup of coffee. You know, I love an afternoon cup of coffee. Well, I love an early morning cup of coffee. Heck, I even like coffee at night, so really, I guess it really doesn't matter. All right, let's continue uh, back to the screencast. Uh, the next section is called States' Rights and the Bank, meaning the National Bank. Now, as we start this year, States' Rights, and that's our first bullet, the States' Rights Doctrine is the idea that since the states form the national government, state power should be greater than federal power. And this is kind of that old Articles of Confederation thinking. And so one state in particular, South Carolina, South Carolina's first actions were to pass the Nullification Act, which voided the tariffs of 1828 and 1832. Now, they even had threatened to withdraw from the Union, which is like, we're not going to pay these taxes. Andrew Jackson, you need to get rid of them. And if you don't, we're going to try to leave the United States. Jackson sternly condemned this action and even threatened using military force against South Carolina if they would try to leave the Union. Imagine that. South Carolina actually wanted to, be, to leave the United States. They, at least they threatened it. Now, while this is going on, the second bank of the United States was given a 20-year charter to act as the government's financial institution. So the national bank issue comes about again. And Jackson also questioned, our fifth bullet, Jackson also questioned the legality of the national bank, and he believed it to be unconstitutional. So, of course, it goes to the Supreme Court. And in the law case, McCullough versus Maryland, the Supreme Court ruled that the National Bank was indeed constitutional, but Jackson would later veto the renewal anyways and get rid of it. And to his credit, the National Bank will be gone. It'll be history. And Jackson gets credit for getting rid of it. So good job with that, Jackson. So write a question, come back for our last section. So Jackson becomes the veto king. He's actually going to veto more uh, bills, a little side note, than the first six presidents put together. So hence part of the reason he was called and King Andrew Jackson. Okay, so our last section here, the Indian Removal Act. Uh, it's very famous and it's actually uh, quite sad. What happens here, under pressure from Jackson, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act in 1830, authorizing the removal of Native Americans who lived east of the Mississippi River. Congress then established, under Jackson's wishes, the Indian Territory in what is now present-day Oklahoma. And you see that up in the map right up here. So little by little, he's going to be starting moving all the different uh, Native American tribes to manage Indian removal of Western lands. Congress approved the creation of a new government agency, which is called the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So tribes are just being forced off their lands, taken to Oklahoma. And in 1832, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Worcester, W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R, versus Georgia, that the Cherokee Nation was a distinct community and that they could stay where they were at. But Jackson would move them anyways. So the Supreme Court tells them that they can stay and Jackson doesn't care. He gets them out. And lastly, the Cherokees' 800-mile force march off their lands and relocation to the territory in Oklahoma became known as the Trail of Tears. So write a question as this concludes Jacksonian democracy. We'll see you next time.